All right, so we're going to get into chemistry, and chemistry is all about changes in matter. So to start off, let's talk about what matter actually is. Matter is defined as anything that has mass and takes up space, it has a volume, essentially. So some examples here in this picture, the sun, that's matter, clouds, the cat is wonderful matter, the person, the glasses, the butterfly, that's somehow just resting on their computer, well, that's matter, as is the computer itself, coffee, delicious coffee, etc. So that's some ideas or examples of matter, and of course, matter is all around us and anything that has mass and takes up space would be defined as matter. So let's get into the five points of the particle theory of matter. And the particle model of matter is incredibly important for our understanding of chemistry. Uh, and the first point is that all matter is made of tiny particles. So no matter what it is, any matter, if we take a look at it, we actually will find that we have teeny, teeny, tiny particles. And we can keep on cutting it down into smaller and smaller pieces until finally we get a particle that is representative of the actual matter itself. Uh, we're going to learn more and more about those particles as we go on. Each pure substance has its own kind of particle different from the particles of other pure substances. So every pure substance has a unique particle that is well, unique to it. So if I have water, for example, on the bottom there, I have, of course, these H2O molecules that at the end of the day, all the particles in pure water will end up being H2O. For gold, right, I've got these atoms of gold and every single atom will be the exact same. Now, with water, this is a compound, so not every atom is the same, but every particle is the same. And when I'm talking about particle for water, I'm talking about a molecule of water. So for a pure substance, uh, every particle will be identical to the other particles, and each pure substance has a unique particle to it. Uh, particles attract one another. So when you take a look at particles, they have a force of attraction that wants them to come together. Particles are always moving. In a solid, a liquid, or a gas, it doesn't matter. They are in constant motion. However, in the different states of matter, the type of motion they may have might be different. And if we increase temperature, that means that we're increasing the movement of these particles. So the higher the temperature, the faster the particles are moving, the higher the average kinetic energy of particles is. So matter, as you know, exists in three different states, and that's solid, liquid, and gas. And we're gonna get into how the motion is different in these three states of matter. Now there's other states besides this, but these are the main states that we deal with in day-to-day -day life and in chemistry, right? It's solid, liquid, and gas. Uh, and here's a video on the three states of matter. In the solid state, the attractive forces between particles is very, very strong. And as a result, particles are closely packed together. They're tightly packed. Uh, and particles are able to vibrate. They can vibrate back and forth, but they're still staying in the same spot, which is why solids stay the shape that they are, right? When I have a solid like this pen, it's pen shaped because the particles in the pen are vibrating in place. They're moving, the particles have movement, but they're staying in the same location. If we were in a classroom, I would say it's kind of like in a classroom where you have a seating plan and you're stuck in one spot. Sure, you might be fidgeting and kind of moving around in your desk, but you're still staying in one, the one location and that's how it is in a solid. Uh, another thing to mention, and it's not actually on this particular slide, uh, but the, back, the fact that solids will not take the shape or the volume of their container. So if I were to put this in a container, and I'm looking around right now, I don't unfortunately have a container I can use, but if I put it into a container, it's going to remain pen-shaped, right? Because it's a, a pen. So a solid will remain the same shape that it was uh, and it will not take the volume of the container either. It's not going to fill it up. Okay. So in other words, solids have a defined shape and volume. Uh, so here's a picture taking a look at particles in a solid. And here's, uh, well, actually an analogy. Um, I'm not super comfortable with this analogy because they're still actually moving around from place to place in a mosh pit. But imagine if all these people stayed in the exact same location, but just moshing like crazy. 
uh, that would be an example of kind of people acting like a solid. So each one of these people would represent a particle moving in one spot. Here's a Eureka video. Eureka videos are really kind of weird and fantastic, but here's a Eureka video talking about solids. In a liquid state, the attractive forces are weaker than a solid, so the particles have some spaces in between. The particles roll or slide past one another. So in a liquid, particles are freer to move around. They're still strongly attracted to each other, so they still kind of stick together, but they can slip and slide past one another. They can have some movement. Okay, um, so particles in a liquid are vibrating, they're rotating, and they have a little bit of place to place or what we call translational motion. And that's because they've overcome some of their attractive forces to be able to move around from spot to spot. They're not as densely packed as a solid would be for most, most substances. Water is the exception. Um, in water, a solid is actually less dense. The particles are further apart in a solid than in a liquid. But water is very unique in that it does that. That's very strange. Normally, particles are further apart in a liquid. Particles in a liquid are like humans at a party. So they're able to move around from spot to spot. They've got some motion. They're not stuck in one place. So that would be the idea of kind of like a liquid. Now, if I put a liquid into a container, like here's my water bottle, yeah? So if I put a liquid into a container, it takes the shape of the container. So look at this. It's now a different shape. And here it is as a cylinder. And here it is as a that shape, whatever that shape is. So it takes the shape of its container, but it doesn't take the volume. It hasn't completely filled this up, right? I mean, I know if I filled it up with water, then it would, but I'm saying that the amount of water I put in here, it doesn't take the volume of that container. So in other words, for a liquid, I have an indefined shape, but I have a defined volume. Here's a video, Eureka video again on liquids. In a gas, the attractive forces between particles are the weakest, so the particles have overcome that attraction, and they've now separated from the other particles, and now they have a bunch of space between them. They are further apart, and they're able to move around more freely. So in a liquid, I now have all of this movement, and they can get away from the other particles. I have uh, vibration, I have rotation, and I have that translational place-to-place -place motion happening for the particles in a gas. So now if I talk about a gas in terms of in a container, right, a gas will have an indefined shape and an indefined volume. So a gas will fill up whatever container it's in and it will take the shape of whatever container it's in. Right now, the air around us is taking the shape of the container it's in, which is the room I'm in right now, right? If I close the door and made it airtight. Um, so in a gas, Basically, particles have overcome their attraction. They are now huge spaces between particles. They have all types of motion. They're moving around like crazy all over the place. Uh, and particles in a gas, or rather I should say a gas period, has a indefined shape and an indefined volume. So it takes the shape and volume of whatever container it goes into. The state of matter will depend on its temperature. Uh, substances may change state as temperature changes. Although what's interesting to note is during the phase change, the temperature will actually remain the same. So uh, look at water, right? For water, it's going to be a solid below zero degrees Celsius, and it reaches zero, and then it goes through melting, or what we call fusion scientifically, as it turns from a solid to a liquid. So during that time when it's changing from solid to liquid, that whole time it's at zero degrees Celsius until everything's a liquid. And then we have liquid until 100 degrees Celsius, where it changes to a gas through vaporization, right? And then again, um, during that vaporization process, it's staying at 100 degrees Celsius. So boiling water, boiling water is always going to be the same temperature. It's going to be 100 because as soon as it uh, turns to a gas, it leaves the pot. It's out of there, right? That's why a pressure cooker actually cooks things so quickly is because it's trapping in the gaseous water so it can actually get hotter. All right, so I have solid, liquid, and gas. Uh, I want to show this diagram the idea that 
as I add energy, right, it goes from solid to liquid and then liquid to gas. But as I lose energy, it goes from gas to liquid and then liquid to solid. So going up from a lower energy state to a higher energy state, that takes energy. It's what we call an endothermic process. We're gonna talk about that later on as we talk about reactions, but endo means in. So thermic is heat, so heat is going in, right? Uh, in order for me to go from solid to liquid and then liquid to gas, heat has to go in, endothermic, in heat. When I have energy being lost, that's an exothermic process. Exo means out, thermic heat, so heat out. If I go from gas to liquid or liquid to solid, it's losing energy to go to those lower energy states. So let's talk about the different state changes. And this is stuff that you should be familiar with from other classes. You went through a lot of this actually, specifically in grade seven, and then again, some of it in grade eight. In fact, I just taught some of this to my grade eights not so long ago, because we started with the chemistry unit. Uh, so involving solids, I kind of did this in two different uh, groups, changes involving solids, and then changes involving gases. And then by covering those two groups, I cover everything because the ones that include liquids are going to involve either solids or gases, right? So changes involving solids, I have fusion, which we call normally melting, but scientifically we're gonna use the word fusion. And that means I have a solid changing to a liquid and that is an endothermic process. So it takes heat. In order for it to melt, it takes heat. And you might think, but wait, ice feels cold. You're right, ice is cold. And the reason why ice is cold and it feels cold is because it's sucking the energy out of your hand. Energy comes out of your hand into the ice, causing the ice to melt. Okay, so uh, the reason why it feels cold is because it's taking heat away from you. In the same way, when you get out of the shower and you feel cold, it's because you have the water evaporating from your skin. That water is going through vap uh, vaporization. It's actually called evaporative cooling. So... What's happening, the reason why you feel cold, is because energy is coming out of you into the water, causing it to turn into gaseous water. Okay, uh, freezing or solidification being the scientific word. I have heat leaving, right? And it's turning from a liquid to a solid. So in this case, it's an exothermic process. Heat is leaving because it's going from a higher energy state to a lower energy state. It's going from sol uh, liquid, sorry, to solid. Sublimation. In sublimation, we actually use this for two different processes. We call this sublimation of a gas going to a solid or a solid going to a gas. So both ways we call it sublimation. Um, so the normal example for this, we don't deal with much sublimation, but dry ice is sublimation. So when we have solid dry ice turning to gaseous uh, carbon dioxide, right, then that is sublimation taking place. It's going from a solid to a gas. From a gas to a solid, this also happens sometimes. Uh, this is actually sometimes used to purify solids, so we actually cause it to evaporate and then we collect it on a cold surface. Changes involving gases, we have sublimation again. This is the solid turning to a gas. Uh, then also we have vaporization, which is a liquid changing to a gas. This takes heat, heat goes in. So this is an endothermic process, right? You heat up liquid to turn it into a gas. And then we have condensation, which is the opposite way, and this is a gas turning to a liquid. This releases energy, it's an exothermic process. Anyways, a lot of me talking, the idea is, if I go back to this diagram, if I'm going up, right, solid liquid gas, solid being the lowest, liquid middle, gas highest, if I'm going up in energy, that means it's an endothermic process, I'm gaining energy. If I go down in the state, well, I'm losing energy. That's an exothermic process. So this triangle of the different states is something that's important to know. You should know the names of the different uh, phase changes if you don't already. So it's all here, right? I've got this labeled in kind of blue and orangey red. Um, so the red represents uh, endothermic in that heat is going in. Well, the blue represents exothermic, so heat is leaving, it's going down in energy. So take a look at that, make sure you understand it, it's good to know. Here's a video on the fourth state of matter, one of the other states. Okay, 
So that's the information on states. Now we're getting into the classification of matter. All matter can be classified or assigned into the following categories or groups. Uh, so we have matter splitting off into pure substances or mixtures. And then under pure substances, I've got elements and compounds. And under mixtures, I have homogeneous and heterogeneous mixtures. You should have covered this in grade eight. This should be review. And we actually go through this again, funny enough, in science 10, but we cover it quite a bit in detail in science nine. And more is gonna be expected of you here than in grade eight in that uh, you're expected to be able to tell from examples what it fits into. So you'll see some work on that uh, in the next day or two. So we can tell which group a sample of matter fits into by considering the particles involved, its physical appearance, and its chemical properties. Uh, so the particles is kind of like the theoretical, right? Uh, we can't see the particles, so we kind of know how the particles would look, um, but that's theory. And then when we look at physical and chemical properties, that's empirical data. It comes from our observations. Okay, we're gonna get more into this kind of terminology later. But when we talk about chemical and physical properties, we're talking about observations, what we can see. So we're gonna go through how we can tell. First of all, we'll talk about the different types, but then we'll talk about how we can tell what it fits into. So in a pure substance, first of all, all the particles are the same. And we kind of talked about this in the particle theory of matter, that point that in a pure substance, every particle is identical and that each pure substance has its own unique particle. So this means a pure substance cannot be separated into different substances by a physical process. That's an important term, physical versus chemical. Compounds can be separated into smaller parts by a chemical process. So if I take a look at an element, every single atom in an element is the same. Okay, so every atom, every ball here is identical, right? Look at this, iodine. Every ball here, every atom is identical. In a compound, and this would be a diagram of, let's say, water, H2O, I have every molecule is the same. Okay, so every molecule is the same, every particle. Uh, but it's made out of more than one element. I have more than one type of ball here, more than one type of atom. But every particle in a pure substance is the same. So let me ask you this. Of these, which ones are pure substances? And I'll start us off. A is a pure substance. Can you figure out which other ones are pure substances? So what I'm asking there is which particles are, you know, the same? Well, B, all the particles are the same, right? I've got all of them are one darker and one um, not dark ball here. Uh, F, every particle is the same. I would say that E is, although that's a bit strange. H, every particle is the same. J, every particle is the same. I is a tricky one. It looks good, but we actually have two types of particles. We have this one with the two balls, and then we have the three balls here. Uh, K, every particle is the same. And L, every particle is the same. So A, B, E, F, J, K, L, these are all, and H, these all have uh, just one type of particle going on. So let's talk about elements specifically. Examples of elements, well, you know it's an element if you look at the periodic table of elements. So first of all, where we are, I feel like I'm moving too fast. Where we are right now is we're talked about pure substances as every particle is the same and cannot be physically separated, could be chemically separated, but not physically. And now we're diving into elements. So in an element, every atom is the same. And examples of elements include gold, silver, oxygen, helium, copper, aluminum, uh, graphite, which is a type of carbon, but it's pure carbon. All of these are examples of elements. And the way that we know that something is an element is because we find it on the periodic table of elements. It's how we can tell. Okay, so if you take a look at the periodic table, you'll see that it's on there, and therefore you know it's going to be an element. If it's something like graphite, right, it will actually say again in brackets or somehow it will give you the element name so you're aware. Some people get trick, tricked up by, um, or tripped up, I should say, by weird kind of ways of putting things, like let's say copper pipe or magnesium ribbon or a silver earring. 
that doesn't mean anything what form it's in. It's still silver, right? It's still magnesium, even if it's in a ribbon format. So don't get confused by different shapes. It still is the element it's made out of. Uh, compare that to a compound. In a compound, I have two or more elements that are chemically bonded together. But again, every particle is still the same. Compounds can, though, be chemically separated into elements by a chemical reaction. So for example, if I take water, I can chemically separate water uh, into hydrogen and oxygen, so into H2 gas and O2 gas by putting some electricity through it. And then it gets separated into its elements that make it up. But that's by a chemical reaction. That doesn't just happen. Uh, it has to go through a chemical reaction in order for that to take place. So compounds can be chemically separated into their elements, but again, it's a chemical process. Now, it's really important for us to talk about the fact that in a compound, atoms have different properties okay, than they would as their elements. So when I take two elements or more and combine them together to make a compound, this is now a new substance and it doesn't have the same properties of what it's made out of. It's not the average of the properties it's made out of, it's something new. It has a new identity in terms of the properties it has. So let's, for example, compare um, or think about sodium chloride, NaCl solid. This is table salt. You put it on your fries, it's delicious, yeah? But if I add sodium and chlorine separately, Sodium, if I were to eat that and swallow it, it would light on fire in my stomach. Okay, it would actually like burst into flames. Uh, and then chlorine is poisonous. It's like a nerve toxin. So I'd be spasming on the ground. So if I took a chunk of sodium and ate it and then breathed in some chlorine gas, right? I, I would die a horrible death. It would be awful. It'd be horrible. But NaCl solid, table salt, is fine for you. And the reason why is because when sodium and chlorine are bonded together, when they're in a compound, it's now something different than sodium and chlorine. It's sodium chloride. Okay, so when uh, elements are bonded together in a compound, they no longer have the same properties as the elements it's made out of. That's really important. It's now something new. Same with water. Hydrogen and oxygen, right? Um, if you put those together, they'd be flammable. They'd blow up but then water puts out fire. Okay, so if I had a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen, a mixture not chemically bonded together, uh, that would be like explosive. It's used for rocket fuel. But when hydrogen and oxygen are chemically bonded together, it's in a compound, right? Well, then we have water. Okay, so, so far we've covered pure substance. We've talked about elements. We've talked about compounds. So from these different examples, let me ask you first which one or which ones are elements from these examples. And the ones that we have that are elements, in other words, every single atom is the same, is I have E is an element, F is an element, every atom here is the same, H is an element, J is an element, every atom is the same, and K is an element. Okay, the next question, which one, uh, which ones of these represent compounds? And the ones that are compounds is I have A is a compound, every particle is the same, made out of, you know, two different elements. B is a compound. What else? And L. So I have A, B, and L are compounds. So some examples of compounds, water, which is H2O, table salt, sodium chloride, sucrose is C12, H22, O11. So I have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, all bonded together for this. Um, so in one particle of sugar, one molecule of sugar, I have 12 carbon atoms, 22 hydrogen atoms, and 11 oxygen atoms, all bonded together into one particle. Baking soda is sodium hydrogen carbonate, NaHCO3 solid, carbon dioxide is CO2 gas, 
Uh, acetone, I'm blanking on C3H6O, I believe. Okay, these are all examples of compounds. Now, if I give you a question saying like, hey, which one of these is compounds? Outside of water, table salt, and carbon dioxide, um, I would give you either the systematic name or the formula. And you can tell it's a compound by the fact that it has more than one element in the formula. In other words, more than one capital letter, because every element symbol has one capital letter. So like for water, I've got H2O, right? I got hydrogen and oxygen. In sucrose, I have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Here I have sodium, hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen all bonded together. So I'd either give you the formula, and you can tell it's a compound because it has more than one capital letter together in a formula, or I'll give you the name, and the name will have more than one element name kind of combined together in a fancy way, like carbon dioxide. Well, I have carbon and I have oxygen. So when you see these kind of fancy names, and we'll get more into the names later on so they make sense, you're gonna learn how to make these names. But when you see these names that contain more than one element, you know it's a compound. All right, let's talk about mixtures. In a mixture, I have two or more pure substances um, combined together. And in that mixture, every particle is not the same. I have more than one type of particle going on here because each substance that's in the mixture retains its own chemical and physical properties. And in fact, we can separate the things in the mixture by a physical process, like by boiling off the water, for example, distillation, crystallization, whatever. We can get the different parts out of our mixture by a physical process not involving a chemical reaction. So let's talk about how each thing retains its properties. If I talk about Coca-Cola, right, it's wet because it has water, yeah, in there. It's sweet because it has sugar in there. It's got that brown coloring from the caramel coloring. It can etch concrete because it has phosphoric acid inside of it, okay? All these properties are there because of different things that are combined together, but they're not chemically bonded together. They're just mixed. So it still retains all of its uh, chemical and physical properties for each substance that's in it. So if I take a look, which one of these uh, diagrams represents a mixture? Well, C would be a mixture because I have more than one type of particle going on here. D would be a mixture. G would be a mixture. I would say that I is a mixture because I have more than one type of particle going on this and then this. And then uh, that's it. That's what I got. So all of these would be examples of mixtures based on how the particles are showing up. Mixtures can be classified either as homogeneous uh, or solutions, right? Or heterogeneous or mechanical mixtures, another term for it. But we're gonna start transitioning towards saying either homogeneous or heterogeneous. Uh, homogeneous or homo means same, all appears the same. Well, hetero means different. So when I say, uh, homogeneous or homogeneous, however you want to say it, I'm saying it all looks the same. Well, heterogeneous, hetero, means that it looks different. I can see differences. So in a homogeneous mixture, you cannot see divisions between substances. It all looks the same or uniform. In a heterogeneous mixture, you can see the different parts. So the way that I tell between homogeneous and heterogeneous is I just have to picture it in my mind or see it and then know uh, which one it fits into. Okay, so here are some examples of both, right? Heterogeneous, things like cereal and milk, ice and soda, soil, blood, homogeneous, vodka, steel, air, rain, all these things. Um, this can get somewhat tricky when we're talking about liquids. The way that we actually tell that something is homogeneous or a solution is can light travel through it? And if light can travel through it and doesn't get scattered or dimmed like crazy, well, then we know it's a solution or a homogeneous mixture. If it can't get through, then it's going to be heterogeneous in some way. So let's talk about colloids or suspensions because this is a type of heterogeneous mixture. Uh, colloid, colloids and suspensions are similar, but suspensions will actually separate over time. So if I give time for a suspension, it's going to settle and I'm going to end up with uh, stuff from the suspension on the bottom. Colloids do not separate over time. It all still remains mixed together. So examples of colloids, uh, mayonnaise, milk, lotion, these are all colloids. You might think milk, isn't that a homogenous mixture? No, it's not. 
Take a look at milk really closely. You can see different parts. You can see the protein and the fat globules in the milk and uh, light does not travel through milk, right? Scatters the milk. So I kind of talked about this already, but how can you tell the difference between a solution, a suspension, or a colloid? If you shine a beam of light through a solution, the light will not scatter or dim. It will travel through, unlike for a suspension or a colloid. A suspension will separate in time. A colloid will not. Okay, so all in all, picture of this, I have matter. Uh, the first question is, can it be physically separated? If the answer is no, well, it's a pure substance, right? It can't be separated by a physical process. If the answer is yes, it's a mixture. If it looks all uniform together for a mixture, well, then it's homogeneous. If it doesn't, it's heterogeneous. For a pure substance, can it be chemically decomposed by a process? Well, if it can, it's a compound. If it can't, it's an element. All right. Well, that's it. Uh, we're going to go through some examples uh, in class and kind of figure this out. But that's it for today. Have a good one.